Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Franz Swanepoel, and I'm Director for International Strategic Partnerships at the University of Pretoria, and also directing the FSNet Africa Food Systems Research Network for Africa. I appreciate the time that you have made to join us today. I would like to extend a special welcome to the Vice Chancellors, Professor Tawana Kupe of the University of Pretoria and Professor Simone Beitendijk of the University of Leeds. This virtual meeting is a reminder that the world continues to face a health crisis that is impacting on people's lives and their ability to access food. While Africa faces challenges of food insecurity, it also offers immense possibilities and opportunities for ending global hunger and malnutrition. The Food Systems Research Network, or FSNet Africa, provides a wonderful opportunity to transform the African food system by strengthening research capacities to address these challenges. FSNet Africa is a collaborative initiative between the University of Pretoria, the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom, and the Food, Agriculture, Natural Resources Policy Analysis Network, or uh, FANERPAN. This is one of the research excellence projects funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund through the partnership between ARUA, the African Research University Alliance, and UKRI. As we announce the FSNet Africa Partnership today and celebrate World Food Day, let us also appreciate and take stock of the possibilities that exist to end hunger on the African continent and beyond. Today, we will have two focused ses sessions. The first session will include welcoming remarks from Professor Ernest Ariyiti, the Secretary General of Arua, also the uh, former Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana. A special word of welcome to you, Professor Ariyiti. This will be followed by a keynote address by Professor Tim Benton, the co-chair of the lead expert group responsible for the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for the Nutrition Foresight Report. This keynote will focus on priority actions for African food systems emerging from this foresight report. This will then be followed by a discussion which will be moderated by Professor Lindy Wesibanda, the recently appointed director of the Arua Center of Excellence in Food Systems, hosted by the University of Pretoria in collaboration with the University of Ghana and the University of Nairobi with Professor Tawana Kupe and Professor Beitendijk. This first session will be concluded by remarks by Dr. Chilitsim Majavendila, the CEO of Fanerpan. We will have a comfort break then, and the second session will be a closed session for the academic partners of FSNet Africa, including 10 African partner universities representing six different countries. Unfortunately, we will not have time for a formal question and answer session, but you are welcome to post any questions and answers through the Zoom function. Our team will respond to these and also on social media. You can also follow us on Twitter using the handle at FSNet Africa. Also, please note that this session will be recorded and made available on our respective websites and social media platforms. In the interest of time and without any further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Ernest Ariyeti to offer introductory and opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Franz, for this invitation. I'm very happy that uh, UP uh, has put this together and has invited Arua to say a few things at the opening. I will not say much. I mean, uh, basically, uh, what I would like to do is uh, uh, let our audience know a little bit about Arua and then talk briefly about our interest in food security. Uh, as uh, you may all know, Arua is uh, about basically achieving excellence in capacity building. Uh, we are doing this uh, through collaboration among 16 of Africa's flagship universities. 
Uh, we focus considerably on achieving high quality research, supporting our institutions to do that. Uh, we are very interested in graduate training, enhancing it to ensure that there's good quality in what Africa is producing. Uh, we are also very interested in research management, uh, ensuring that uh, we are able to attract good grants, uh, largely because we are able to manage these properly. And we use the research that we do uh, for enhancing advocacy within the region. Uh, we, we, we try to do all of this by having what we call the centers of excellence. Uh, these centers of excellence are located in nine universities. There are 13 of them. I'm very happy that Pretoria uh, hosts one of these, that's our center for food security. And I guess that's the reason why I've been here today. So uh, we are currently also working with the European Universities uh, uh, Guild uh, uh, of Research Universities in Europe, trying to increase the number of centers of excellence that we have to about 40 from the current 13. Uh, we expect to do this through support from the European Union attracted about 20 million euros a year for that period, uh, the five-year period. Um, we are working today with the Open Society Foundation in the, in the Open Society Foundation, uh, trying to enhance our work on uh, vaccine research. It's a new thing for us. Um, it has been motivated largely by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have established three hubs at Makerere, at the University of Ghana, at UCT, to pursue our interest in vaccine research. And it's something that we hope very soon will become big in working together with the Africa CDC. Um, our programs for capacity building are looking closely at PAD training. And here we can agree to pursue split site PADs um, where our universities will be able to work closely with the uh, European, and you know, especially UK universities in this regard. We've also got some money to be able to support our centers of excellence to do postdoctoral work. And uh, we are working with the current Indian Corporation of New York in pushing this agenda. Uh, our work in food security uh, makes a major part of what we did, as I said earlier. And we are working closely with Pretoria to ensure that this happens in a manner that is sustainable. As we are here today uh, for this uh, event, uh, we very much are fully aware of what uncertainties have um, hit our world. We, we know how uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, forced countries to look more inward uh, in pursuit of uh, various policies. Um, so we've seen the way medical supplies have been uh, supplied, made available to communities. We've seen how uh, various Basic items have been made available, how African governments have supported the distribution of food and so on. So some effort has gone into ensuring food security. But clearly, clearly, this has not been uh, very successful in many places. So there's the need for African governments to think in a more structured way towards how to enhance food security. Uh, import dependent African economies have to clearly find avenues to meet domestic consumption needs. Um, this clearly was something that many of them have pushed with some difficulty. How can we help them in the coming months to be able to do this better? Uh, some have been more successful than others. There were situations of poverty in most countries, inequality in most countries, unemployment in most countries. These have been made worse by the pandemic. It's my hope that uh, through our uh, event here, uh, we'll be able to discuss in a much more structured way how we can assist African governments to move forward. A number of things have been brought forward. Um, achieving food security uh, is now more important in most of our countries than ever before. At no time have the, uh, the vision of our Center of Excellence of Food Security to harness partnerships in research and innovation uh, be more critical than before. Uh, so we are very, very happy that uh, UP is in a position to host this. We are very happy with the arrangement that have been made. And Arua stands fully supportive of this initiative. Arua is going to do everything possible to provide the kind of support that will make the Center of Excellence in Food Security even more effective. Uh, so as I end my remarks, I just want to underscore the fact that uh, uh, when this World Food Day 
uh, has passed and we reflect on the things that we've learned from uh, the, today's events and also the last few uh, months and so on, we'll be able to come away with the fact that uh, the Center of Excellence for Food Security, uh, University of Pretoria, um, the um, Arua as a network, was able to discuss these things in a very uh, objective way and provided some solutions to what could be done to make the situation much better in various African countries, rich or poor. So I thank you, friends and colleagues, for inviting me, and I wish you the very, very best uh, during this uh, webinar. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. So firstly, um, congratulations, everybody, on getting Arawa off the ground. Um, a brilliant uh, initiative, a brilliant uh, system. So I'm going to talk today, as Franz has said, a little bit about the Global Panels Foresight 2 report that was launched a few weeks ago. Uh, this is a project that is supported by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the United Kingdom. So just starting off uh, at the beginning, we all know that dietary choices, dietary accessibility around the world is increasingly damaging for health. Poor diets are responsible for more ill health and more mortality than any other cause. And if you look at this map, the darker red and uh, orange and yellow colors are uh, increasing um, issues to do with uh, poor health arising from poor diets. Uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, it is a huge issue. Um, of course, you know, there is the human cost of poor diets in terms of uh, increased illness, uh, increased, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the human cost from a family perspective, there is the economic cost from healthcare perspective, but also there is the cost that arise somewhat indirectly from people uh, not being at their maximum capacity. And some recent work we did at Chatham House indicates that up to 5% of GDP across the low and middle income countries is lost because of poor productivity from people who have suffered malnutrition as children or as adults. Staying on this theme, mal malnutrition, if, especially if it impacts on children, is something that has lifelong uh, health, health consequences, uh, including on economic productivity, as I've just said. This is a map across the world, and, and what you can see is where it's darker colours, again, darker reds, oranges, that is where children are particularly um, suffering. And it's not just suffering from underweight and mi micronutrient deficiency, stunting and wasting and so on, it is also suffering increasingly from uh, the issues to do with over uh, access to calories and hyper-processed food leading to obesity. In almost every country, including most in uh, southern Africa, the twin burdens of undernourishment and obesity are starting to be felt. Not only are food systems uh, punishing for people's health, they're also punishing for the environment. So this is data from the IPCC special report last year that just indicates that about a third of all greenhouse gas, gas emissions are associated with food production, land use change, transport processing of food on a global basis. And clearly, as many people know, food systems are also responsible for huge amounts of land and uh, air and water pollution, biodiversity loss, and all sorts of things that undermine people's abilities to live a healthy and happy life. And of course, climate change in itself is driving negative impacts on food systems, increasing variability in weather, increasing yield costs, and so on. Not, over, not only are our food systems bad for people and the planet, they're also increasingly seen to be fragile, and COVID uh, is a key eye-opener in terms of that, as Franz has also just noticed. Um, I point you towards this quote on the right-hand side here from David Nobarro. COVID-19 will probably double the number of poor people and double the number of malnourished around the world. It is a very difficult situation for us to be in. And across the world, as you look at how our food systems are functioning, new evidence is becoming available on a day-by-day -day basis to show that it is too costly to be sustainable into the future. 
what we need to do is transition our food systems away from the ones that do not provide good health, do not provide a good environment to something that works better. So how to do this? Four key points to start off with. Firstly, there is a huge mismatch between what we should be growing for people to have our healthy diets and what we are growing worldwide. And this figure from the Globan report just shows it. We grow about a third as many fruit and vegetables as we should be growing. And we grow at least 50% too much cereals, too much oils and fats and too much sugar. What we need to do is to start make healthy diets um, uh, available so that there is actually enough fruit and vegetables and enough plant protein available on the planet to feed people. Secondly, we need to make sustainable and healthy diets more accessible. What we can see is that um, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and other lower middle income countries, over the last 20 years or so, this is what this graph shows, over the last 20 years ago, they're becoming more import dependent to get their uh, local food security. Um, much of the developing world uh, is increasingly reliant, therefore, on food security coming through imports rather than from, from local production. Third point is that sustainable and healthy diets must be affordable. There is no good trying to promote people's food and nutrition security by creating a food system where people cannot just afford to get a nutritious diet. Uh, this figure here shows that across much of Africa, a nutritious diet for each household costs between 50 and 100% on average of household income. We have to change the availability and the affordability of food. And of course, those two are related. If we incentivize the production of more fruit and vegetables, uh, volumes will go up, supply will go up and prices will come down. And finally, and this is a, a, a bit of a new thought, in the sense of, uh, of our report, we've got to find a way to make sustainable and healthy diets more desirable. What this figure shows is the growth over the last 15 years or so of consumption of ultra processed food and drinks. So fizzy drinks full of sugar, ultra processed foods full of uh, cheap calories, uh, starchy food, fats and salt and so on. We have got to find a way of creating a situation where diets that are healthy and sustainably produced compete well with the sorts of things that people like to buy and are freely available, including increasingly across even the poorest communities in Africa. So taking those four points together, increasing the um, availability, accessibility, affordability and desirability of food. The Global Panel Report makes uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, recommendations about how to achieve that. So how to transition to a, towards a new and transformed food system. So if you just take uh, going around the quadrants from the top uh, left hand side all the way around, how do we make uh, better food more available? We perhaps rebalance agricultural sector, uh, sector subsidies away from producing grain towards producing nutritious food. We perhaps put more research into thinking about growing different sorts of things that are better for diets and sustainability. In other words, we promote a production of a wide range of nutrient rich foods. Moving on to accessibility, lots of things that we can do. We can cut food loss and waste to, to reduce the uh, way that food drops out of uh, supply chains. We can support job growth across the food system, creating jobs beyond agriculture that makes it profitable to keep food inside the country rather than to export it and so on. Affordability, we need to protect the most vulnerable in society. So we need uh, uh, safety nets so that the most vulnerable do have access to subsidised or, or food aid. We need to uh, uh, reduce costs of the, the uh, unsustainably and unhealthy foods. Um, and uh, no, we need to increase the cost of unsustainable and unhealthy foods and reduce cross costs of uh, well-produced uh, healthy foods uh, through te technology investment and innovation. And we can do some of this by adjusting tax, the taxes and subsidies on food, on, on key foods. And finally, the desirability. There are lots of things that we can do to change desirability. We can increase levels of uh, education, 
from school all the way through to civil society. We can have a strong public awareness campaign. We can update our food-based dietary guidelines from the government uh, to promote enhanced knowledge about why the right diet is, the, is a good thing. Better regulation of advertising and marketing and thinking about how to do behavioral nudges about changing the food environment. So lots of things in the report about concrete steps, but three big um, uh, buckets of things that we know we can do better and we know we can do immediately. Firstly, we need to empower and build capacity in systems thinking, particularly across government, to avoid the siloization and policy incoherence that we see all around the world, that health policy points in a different direction from agricultural policy and trade policy cuts across them both. Second point that we can do immediately is build coalitions to drive change. That is coalitions of stakeholders, um, policy makers, industry, farmers, civil society, as well as experts from academia. And the third point that we can do immediately is start to establish specific metrics to allow us to monitor whether or not we are making the progress that we need to make. Certainly, if you think within climate change mitigation, um, we've got very strong metrics. Every country that signed up to Paris has made commitments to do their NDCs. What we need is something around the food system to allow us to see whether or not we are doing the transition to the transformed food system that we need. So key steps further, what do we really need to focus on using the methodologies on the last slide? We need to resolve and reconcile policy distortions and align policy to avoid incoherence. We need to be better at identifying targets that are triple wins or quadruple wins and manage to drive positivity for the prosperity of smallholder farmers positivity for their nutrient outcome, nutrition outcomes and are also better for the environment. There are many ways that we can do that, but we have been too targeted on single solutions in single silos. We need to leverage existing interventions that can be more food system friendly. So rather than thinking about agriculture or thinking about nutrition and health at the consumption end, we need to think about how we can get all of those things aligned we're investing a lot on supply chains. Let's invest on, in supply chains uh, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa that are not just based on profit maximization, but are based on nutrition, for example. We need to protect the most vulnerable and ensure that the transition to more sustainable and more healthy food is just. Um, some modeling work within the GLOPAN report showed that in the long run, if we did all of the rebalancing subsidies, et cetera, et cetera, healthy diets will be cheaper than the diets that most people have access to today. But to get there, there will be inevitably changes in price structures and we've got to make sure that the most vulnerable are covered by a safety net. And perhaps most importantly for Arawa, we need to build capacity for managing the food system and thinking about the food system rather than just thinking about agriculture or consumption or supply chains or trade, etc. And that building the capacity needs to come in, in conjunction with development partners like FCDO and with uh, academic institutions like we're representing today. So finally, four quick, uh, five quick messages. Uh, we all, every country in the world, face these planetary issues. We know that we're doing that. We know that COVID like the locusts in, in uh, northeast, uh, northeast Africa, we know that uh, climate change is going to drive increasingly disruptive patterns um, that will disrupt food system and hurt people's uh, ability to maintain food security. We all face these, these uh, problems and we have to act to deliver better outcomes. Diets represent a key link between our health as people and planetary health. And so if we are gonna tackle some of these problems in the future, we've got to acknowledge that linkage that human and planetary health and economic prosperity are all enabled or disabled by our food systems. Action is possible and action is urgent and we can do it today. We can start today. We just have to get the momentum going. Achieving 
sustainable, healthy diets must be a priority on the global policy agenda. And next year, we've got discussions around food for the UNFCCC COP. We've got discussions around food for the Biodiversity COP. And we've obviously got discussions around food around the Nutrition for Growth Summit and the World Food System Summit. And those will also carry into the presidencies of the G7 and G20. So action on this uh, issue is increasingly going to be part of the global policy agenda. And we have to make sure that that is reflected both at national level and subnational level. So all nations and actors have roles to play, key roles, but we can do it. We can make these steps. So with that, here is the link to the report. Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk about this. Thank you very much, Professor Benton for and Tim Benton for unpacking for us this exciting report that has been availed to the world. We are celebrating World Food Day, African Action for Zero Hunger. I'd like to thank Professor Areti for unpacking what African Research University Alliance Arua is all about and the major achievements that you've made within a very short time and the exciting work that's in store for the university alliances, particularly for us in Africa, as I take up this new challenge of being the chair and director of Arua Center of Excellence in Food Systems at the University of Pretoria in collaboration with the University of Ghana and the University of Nairobi, these are exciting times. Allow me colleagues to then move on to a very exciting session where I bring on board two eminent vice chancellors uh, who will join me in a special panel where we are celebrating World Food Day by focusing on partnerships for sustainable development. I am going to be in discussion with the vice chancellor of the University of Leeds, Professor Simone Beitendeg, who is joining us from the University of Leeds, but previously he was the Vice Provost for Education and Professor of Maternal and Child Health at Imperial College in London. Welcome and thank you for joining this exciting session. Thank you. I have with us the Vice Chancellor of the University of Pretoria, Professor Tawana Kupe. Prior to joining the University of Pretoria, Professor Kupe was the Vice Principal at Wits University, where he founded Media Studies Department. Previously, he lectured at Rhodes University, and his specialization areas are English, Media, and Communication. Welcome, colleagues, as we celebrate this special day where we focus on food. I just want to share with you what food means to you, to me, and then I would hear from you. For me, it's exciting that we talk about food. Traditionally, when we celebrate World Food Day, we go into our silos where we talk about agriculture, we talk about our farming background. But this year is a special year because at the highest level, the United Nations has declared that we move away from just talking about food security and agriculture, where we focused on production of the food, making that food available and accessible in its utilization, we take a broader food systems approach where we look at the production at the farm and the inputs that are required, the harvesting, and the reduction of losses to make sure we don't lose any food when it's produced, the storage and processing to make sure that we retain the nutrients, but most important, we move with the food to the household level not only to the table, but to consumption and healthy foods, healthy diets, and healthy people. Thank you to Professor Tim Benton, who has unpacked that report that really talks about the critical interventions that are required in order to achieve a healthy planet and healthy diets and healthy people. What that means is that we are speaking to the sustainable development goals. All 17 of them have something to do with food. So we are weaving in and creating that connection. The 17 goals talk about the biosphere. They talk about society. They talk about the economy. But most important, the glue that brings all those together is partnerships. 
Hence, this session today, where we focus on not just your partnership, but we want to hear your advice to the world on what makes partnerships tick, particularly in this arena of food systems. Without further ado, I'm keen to hear from you. Let's just draw back. Professor Simon, what does food mean to you? Thank you, um, Professor Subanda, for that very challenging question. And you had forewarned me, but I, I still don't know exactly what I'm going to say because I could probably write a book about it and lots of books have been written about food. So let me try to be short. I think food means lots of different things, of course, at the personal level. Um, we all know that food and, and celebrating uh, eating together is a hugely social activity and no matter where you come from, I'm, I'm from the Netherlands, which doesn't have a very rich food tradition, I think most Dutch food I find quite boring. Um, but still, of course, there is a tradition in my country as well um, of eating together and, and using food as a, as a great way of actually being social. But from my maternal and child health background, I also look at food more systemically. Um, when I was active as a researcher, I was involved in a, a national study in the Netherlands into um, child growth. And it started basically to monitor how tall children would grow. Uh, but in, in the last decades of it, it was repeated like eight times after World War II. It changed into looking also at their weight and the weight compared to the height. And it, it turned out to be, a, to be, it became a study basically on child obesity. And one of the most challenging elements of how children's uh, height and, and weight changed in the Netherlands over the last 40 years was that it, it made very clear that obesity was increasingly becoming, becoming a problem, but especially in children from an immigrant background and from lower socioeconomic uh, uh, background families. So food also is so related to inequality and, and it can be a good thing and a bad thing and that makes it all really complicated. But I think there and also lies the solution. We'll talk a little bit more about that, no doubt, in this session. Um, so food, I think, is, is very multifaceted. And I think it's, it's so important that we talk about it today from the global perspective, thinking about North-South collaboration and really as comprehensively and inclusively also as the previous two speakers have done, which is really excellent and very inspiring. You've unpegged a whole world of meanings to that word food. If we had spoken a year or two years ago, we would have said, what does an expert in maternal and child health have to do with agriculture issues? But you've highlighted that food is health for the babies in utero with the pregnant mothers. Food is, 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 is a nutrient for good health postpartum. But most important, it's the partnerships that we need to make sure we close the gap between those who produce the food and those who consume and the knowledge yeah. of what food to consume. Thank you very much for unpacking that. Professor Tawana Kupe, what does food mean to you? It means something that I have to do when I want to do other things. Uh, but uh, more seriously, <laughs> it, it means, of course, I think one has to repeat things that have been said at the simplest and most basic yet fundamental level. As both uh, Simon and Professor Tim Benton has shown, it means health, nutrition, growth and potential and physical and mental well-being. I think that if, if, they, if, if people do not have good nutrition, the results are not only physical, they are also mental, and also they affect well-being. They affect their ability to develop their full potential as human beings. So there is that correlation. But from some of the fields that I come from, of course, food is other, if you like, a connotative meanings. Food also is connected to tradition, mm -hmm. uh, custom, and culture. Many cultures celebrate their food traditions in many different ways through rituals and ceremonies that speak to community, family, as well as nation and the world. And also food is a player in almost all sorts of things globally. One of the things that is most well-traveled, the commodity that's well, most well-traveled, not just commercially, but also culturally, is food. 
food being, uh, if you like, uh, exported to one country, adapted in that culture. Maize is a great example. And if you go to Mexico and you study the history of maize in Mexico, and how maize is used in different, differently in Mexico, and then if you go to each country also, the uses and sometimes the abuses of maize is a fascinating historical story and so on. By the way, also there's a darker side to food. Food is connected, of course, to land, space, and so on. And food historically is also connected to wars of conquest and domination and appropriation of land and natural resources. And, and, and of course, that in, in media and communication, especially in film, food is connected to love, hate, and, and also <laughs> intentions. And also between individuals, uh, 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 food in, in, in developing or, or love relationships, food plays a very, very critical role. Uh, there is no, there, there, no wonder there is a tradition of inviting the person to dinner or to lunch or having a coffee in order to broach your, your emotions and your, or, and, or your desires, uh, whatever the case may be. So food is something that is an intricate part of who we are as human beings. But of course, as, as Simon said as well, and I think Prof. Tim Benton said it as well, that really, food also connects us to nature. For some of the food we might grow and develop artificially, some comes naturally from our natural way. As we know, there's an ecological and environmental crisis. How we have obtained and we obtain our food is not only is not respective of nature and the balance between the sustainability of human humanity and the sustainability of the environment and the intricate links between those. If you remember among some of the untested theories uh, about the uh, COVID-19, some people say that uh, the virus moved from animals to human beings in the in the markets in China, in the in the in the wildlife animal markets of China. So again, another relationship they worthy of doing research. So food, I think, is, is, is complicated, is complex, at the same time, quite simple. If you don't eat, you will die. Oh my goodness, what an amazing story about food. And I think after this, we need to go into a contract where we write the story of what food means to both of you. I can already see 12 chapters to a book we start from love to nature to zoonosis, the diseases transmitted from animals to men, to war, to trade, to culture, to pregnancy, to maternal health, to education. That's 12 chapters of a book on what food means to me already. We got it. Let me just pick one of the issues there and zero in on uh, what Professor Tawana Kupe touched on, which is the cognitive capacity. You are both in uh, centers of higher education. You want the best brains on deck, but you've come together in a partnership in higher education institutions, University of Leeds, University of Pretoria. Can you tell us what's this marriage all about? The one thing is that we can't divorce. So I think I want to put that out there. <laughs> so, but this partnership is really about something that's Im important and has become even more important since COVID-19 and other crises that are with us today. First, I think in my view, knowledge knows no borders and should not be restricted by borders. Knowledge should freely flow across all borders because out of knowledge, we can transform a fun, many fundamental things. We can, as Prof. Tim Benton said, transform food systems and create more sustainable food systems. So this partnership really is about one, doing joint research, co-creating knowledge, if you like, which is transformative and creates a better world. Given the world is increasingly interconnected, even if populist politics tries to close it down. Second, it is also about training a new generation of scholars you know, staff student exchanges should generate out of them a, a new generation of scholars and, and a, a rich tradition of peer sharing and core knowledge production. It is also about, if, 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 if you like, making globalization work for humanity and cutting down on the physical borders and boundaries. And I think in this relationship with the Leeds University, we'll do something else. 
we cut down the disciplinary academic boundaries that stifle knowledge. To do a, a research on food systems can only be a transdisciplinary activity. It can't be something that's done by natural scientists, people in the agricultural sciences uh, only. It should be done by a spectrum of people coming from different disciplines, not just to aggregate knowledge, but from the knowledge they currently have to create new forms of knowledge with the aim of transforming our societies and transforming the world. So for me, it's a fundamentally global, globalizing and global uh, and a platform for, for creating global partnerships. I completely agree with everything that Professor Coupe just said, um, so I'll, I, I'll build on that. Um, what it means for me, uh, apart from the things that he so eloquently outlined, um, is, a, is an amazing opportunity at creating a very synergistic, respectful, equal partnership where we can both grow and learn through the collaboration. Um, what, I, what I notice, and I've been in a leadership role in higher education now for almost 10 years, coming from a purely research background, is that I think universities globally and nationally are still far too much in competition with each other and we're driven by being the best um, at publishing and getting research funds at all the things that the global rankings also seem to force us to do. And that's become such a dominant theme for university leaders. And I think it's completely in the way of solving the global challenges. And it's so clear from all the speakers, from the themes of today, from everything we're trying to do in this partnership, that we can only do it if we collaborate, if we get out of our silos, if we look at the entire picture, and if we don't just come at it from our own relatively egotistical needs as, as a university or as university leaders. And I think this, this partnership, which I was really, really pleased to find when I stepped into my job just a month and a half ago, uh, for me symbolizes the opportunities that we can give ourselves and thereby um, the world if we truly uh, work together and create that, that synergy. Um, and I think especially universities in the global north for too long have felt that they, they're the source of the best knowledge. And I think that gets reflected also in the way we, we rank universities and we um, rank knowledge production and the way we think about the, the global knowledge around these big issues, that there's too much of a dominance of the universities who are the highest up in these rankings and it completely negates the knowledge production and the, the incredible wealth of experience and of, of scholarly um, uh, um, uh, knowledge in, in countries in the global south. And we, we cannot do it on our own. So the, the warmth, the, um, the, the, the synergy, the respect in the existing partnership, the combined goals, the strategic yep. thinking, uh, the, the sheer brain power of all the, the scholars in both institutions who are working together on this unbelievably important global theme. It's just, it's, it's mind boggling and it really excites me. And I want to just build on it and see how much more we can work together, perhaps with the entire Wuhan network, with other universities closer geographically to the University of Leeds. We are in the middle of a crisis. You are sitting in the United Kingdom. We are seeing scary figures that are taking us back to six months ago. And the whole world is talking the language of resilience. What lessons are we learning, Professor Coupe? What are our experiences on the impact of COVID-19? And how are partnerships such as the one you're in going to help us bounce back better? So I think it's one of the ironies of the current uh, situation, of course, is that the pandemic is global. So the virus has affected the entirety of the world. But we have lockdowns, which uh, lock down people in their localities and in their countries or in their regions. But to defeat the virus, actually, we need the globe to come together especially knowledge institutions like ours. And, and as my, my colleague, uh, Putin, Prof. Putin said, 
we need to bring others on board in order to be able to achieve that critical scale in mass to address global challenges which have local manifestations. So the pandemic is global, but it has local manifestations. And to defeat it, you need those global collaborations that deal with the local resonance of particular kinds of issues. So on the contrary to what it looks like right now, it shows that we must be more interconnected, interrelated to address complex and complicated local and global challenges. So I think it's reteaching us as we are temporarily you... locked down uh, that actually we are only stronger together and we'll only be able to defeat these things together. The, the issue we're talking about there, the, the food systems and food security, it's a global issue as well. And I think a Prof. Tim Benton showed how we must transform at the local as well as the global level. So I think it's an exciting moment to recommit to the nature of knowledge being beyond boundaries, necessary to be shared among peers globally and necessary to be co-produced and necessary to address both the local and the global. If I were to say, close your eyes and tell me one good thing that happened as a result of COVID-19 emanating possibly from this partnership, university-wide, where you are sitting, what comes to mind? I think it's a realization that uh, really we need each other, if you like. So in relation to Leeds and UP, to give a concrete example, we were going to meet physically in March during Africa week. We didn't meet. But funny enough, it hasn't stopped closer engagement. And in fact, and, and thank you to my colleague uh, Wittenberg, when the, the, our colleagues at Leeds used some of the money that they were meant to use to travel to us, to share with us to do COVID-related research. Wow. And so we're beginning to see that even when we think there are difficulties, every silver cloud, uh, every dark cloud is a silver lining, and there are many more opportunities than we think. I think post-COVID, we will not see too many constraints. We see so many opportunities, because beating this is quite, is, is quite big. I just want to underline that. Leeds, University of Leeds had money that was budgeted for travel to Pretoria and they decided to give that money to you. Can you just in a sentence explain what exactly happened? I simply uh, say that, look, we have this money. Can you come up with projects that are COVID related? You have to spend wow. it within this particular year. We put up the projects together. The projects actually have been carried out and now we are actually doing the the, the accounting part of it. But UP had 30 COVID related projects from you know being involved in PP, producing PPE, uh, clinical trials, uh, not vaccine trials, but other clinical trials and testing, as well as community education in our surrounding communities. And I think Excellent. that shows what, what partners can. Some knowledge has arisen out of that which we'll share with our Leeds colleagues, but we kept our partnership going during the dark days of COVID-19. So that one speaks to the partnership, University of Leeds giving to their partner, but celebrating something joint where they would have come to work on the ground, but they decide use that money, develop proposals, projects, and let's work together. Thank you, Professor Simon Beitendek for that visionary intervention. And I'm sure it will go a long way in cementing the partnership. If we had a billboard where we put your signature on partnerships, we are celebrating World Food Day, African Action for Zero Hunger and Partnerships for Sustainable Development. Professor Simone Beitendek, what would be your signature on that billboard? What do you want the world to know about what partnerships require for them to be sustainable? I think if I would work towards a slogan or something really short and snappy, it would be stronger together or something like that. Um, and I think uh, Professor Coupe said it too, we need each other. There could be another one. Wow. Um, for me, the, the value of, of connection, of working together, of a joint um, vision, at, at both at the very human sort of individual level, getting to know each other and trust each other, but all the way up to the global level. That for me is also what the COVID crisis is 
teaching us. We can't do it alone. Yeah. And we all know, and Professor Arietti said it too, it, it's just a matter of time for the next global crisis. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we know it is going to happen. Professor Tawana Kupe, what's your signature on the billboard? <laughs> Funny enough, that's what, remember, you asked, you prepped us before with these questions. Mine was simply also stronger together. I said it earlier when I was holding it for this, but I'll add something else. Stronger together equals sustainability. And that will be my signature. Let's come back to Mother Nature. Let's come back to your own households. Let's come to your kitchen. What's your favorite food? It's World Food Day. I'm sure you are going to go out and eat good. Mine is the following. Is I could have it for, for breakfast and for lunch, and I often do because I'm lazy to cook. It's a more uh, original muesli plus a variety of fresh food, Greek, plain yogurt, and some honey. Mine is, is sushi. I love Japanese food. And if I'd have to choose one country's food to eat for the rest of my life, the breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, it would be Japanese. So, so I would absolutely choose sushi. So from Europe, we go Japan, Asia, we come Africa, we go Greek for the Greek yogurt, natural. <laughs> we do honey from Africa. Thank you, colleagues, for that exciting celebration of World Food Day. Congratulations on the partnership. Congratulations on the lifelong relationship. We need each other. We have to stay stronger together and we need to have equitable, sustainable partnerships. Thank you for sharing your time. Good afternoon. Uh, you will all agree with me that uh, the hour went by so quickly and the discussions were so enjoyable. But first, let me acknowledge the, pres the presence and the valuable contributions first uh, from uh, Prof. Ernest Arayeti, Secretary General Arua, for delivering the introductory re re remarks and also then give giving us the message of support. True, let me also thank uh, Prof. Tim Penten, who has been a colleague for the longest time, for giving us the keynote address. Indeed, we need a transformed food system which is relevant and based on the context of Africa. Our work is cut out and all actors have got a role to play. Also then, uh, let me also thank the vice chancellors of the two universities. Indeed, also that was a valuable contribution. I wish also I was asked what is my favorite food, but since then it's not my task, then I will not answer that. Thank you, uh, Professor Lindy Westbanda for the facilitation. And last but not least, then Prof. Swanepul then for directing the program. Since uh, we all know that the partnership that we're talking about also has got FANAPAN as a partner. What does the partner mean to FANAPAN? We all know that uh, what we are trying to do here is to generate evidence. However, the observation which is known is that there is a disconnect between research-based evidence, practice, and the making of the policies. So as FANAPAN, our role is to make sure that then for the early research ca career and the fellows that we are engaging, we provide the platform through our node structure to ensure that the evidence that is generated then is connected to the, to, to the space in which the policies are made. So what we need to know is that uh, the in-country uh, knows that we have we're going to be availing we're going to be availing them to the partnership and also to make sure that the research that is gen generated is having a link to those that are supposed then to support us in terms of making sure that research evidence is assimilated to where it's supposed to the main thing that i need to underscore here is that the issue of evidence based policy actions has to be at the center stage of our project here which is F fsnet africa and therefore the World Food Day ca campaign for us themed African Action for Zero Hunger emphasizes that the things that we need to, to do, the evidence that we're generating, need to contribute to a climate smart, nutrition sensitive, and also poverty reducing solutions. And doing that, we know that we should also be fostering gender equality. Then through this project, 
then follow up and work also then will be focusing on ensuring that the partnership then is moving beyond the project life. Like uh, we have heard, this is not a temporary relationship, then we are here for a long haul. That said, I've also been given the responsibility to make announcement that this webinar that we convened has got two sessions. The first one is coming to an end now. However, after a health break of 10 minutes, then at exactly 10 past three, we are asking that people that are belonging to this institution must come and join us then to further our discussion on how best can we implement the project. Those are the representative and staff from University of Pretoria, University of Leeds and Fanapan. Also representatives and staff from FSNet Africa, 10 academic partner institutions. Third, representative and staff from Fanapan Nodes who are partnering with FSNet Africa. And fourth and lastly, any other researchers from these partner institutions who will be interested in applying one to be fellows and to those that wish to be mentors to the fellows. And then when we come back, we'll then depend our discussion around how best can we deliver the project. So 10 past three, let's reconvene and further the discussion. But lastly, then since there are people that won't be joining us for the session, which we are coming back to, let me thank all the partners that have decided to join us to today. We know that there are other competing events that are convened to commemorate, to commemorate the, the day. However, we thank you so, so much for choosing to attend and to partner with us when we start this exciting project. I thank you. <laughs>